electron deficient elephants. Uh, this project was conducted by me and uh, supervised by uh, my advisors, Dr. Gupton and Dr. Castano. Uh, I wanted to appreciate their help and uh, guidance and also specifically appreciate uh, Dr. Meekins for uh, putting up uh, this uh, amazing idea. And uh, this project was funded uh, through Center for uh, Rational Catalyst Synthesis, uh, and, uh, which mm, connects uh, industrial partners, including uh, specifically GSK, Fusioner, and Biogen for this project to proposals that uh, are sent uh, through a consortium of universities. Uh, it's an ICRC and uh, it's a very interesting opportunity as well. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank Medicines for All Institute uh, and VCU's uh, chemical uh, engineering and mechanical engineering departments that uh, also in part supported the work. Uh, just to give a, a brief overview of the center, uh, in this center we are uh, mainly uh, focused on solid supported catalysis, which uh, includes the uh, utilization of uh, immo uh, immobilizing catalytic particles like uh, transition or uh, noble metals on top of uh, uh, solid supports, which has been proven through physical modeling and also experimental analysis that improves the uh, performance of these systems. Uh, and uh, we are focusing on a variety of methods and also different applications such as synthesis and flow and also electrochemical applications. Uh, this is a concern with industrial partners and now four universities uh, through an IUCRC, NSF IUCRC, uh, including Virginia Commonwealth University, University of South Carolina, uh, University of California, Davis, and uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, now, getting into my own presentation, uh, I will be talking a little bit about uh, electrochemistry and background and importance of it, uh, then talk about the Walker type electrooxidation mechanism and why is it important. Uh, then we'll go through the rational catalyst design for it, uh, experimentation and characterization and uh, at the end uh, I'll have the concluding remarks. Uh, as a definition, uh, basically electrochemistry is the study of chemical reactions which take place uh, at the interface of your electrodes that are submerged into uh, a reaction solution, an ion, ion conducting solution which is called electrolyte. And uh, this is important because it deals with interactions between electrical energy and chemical transformations. And uh, this goes both ways. And uh, that's the uh, breeding ground for a lot of research and a lot of uh, industrial uh, improvements and uh, profit as well. Uh, as you can see at the anode, the, uh, the positive uh, electrode of our system, we have oxidation occurring, and at the cathode, uh, around the cathode electrode, we have reduction. And all together, this system is called the redox system. And it's all about the redox. And uh, if a reaction is a spontaneous, uh, then it generates electrical energy. And uh, if not, electrical energy will promote it, and it generates chemical products. That's the whole idea uh, behind electrochemistry uh, as a whole method. Going back to uh, the history, uh, the, M Michael Faraday is known as the founder of the science in uh, a couple of centuries ago, and then we came a very long way, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we came a very long way to now that we have a very widely used uh, applications for electrochemistry going from lithium ion batteries to self-driving cars that made Elon Musk, Elon Musk and uh, also solar panels that are be becoming more prevalent uh, by day. And uh, the aspect that I'm working on is organic electrochemistry, uh, which although it's been uh, studied uh, quite a lot, but it is still uh, quite dormant compared to its uh, full uh, potential. And it is because of the technological deficiencies and unscalability. 
And uh, just not to forget, Nobel Prize in 2019 on, uh, I assume it was physics, uh, was given for uh, lithium ion batteries. And uh, okay. Yeah, so then we, we look at the uh, electrochemical synthesis and uh, what it is. Basically, we utilize that redox process and uh, also use our power of ca uh, catalysts to generate uh, certain products that are not uh, easy to produce through the uh, conventional uh, beaker method, so to speak, or batch method, uh, or uh, now uh, a more sophisticated synthesis and flow. Uh, these reactions, some of them uh, are not really uh, Easy to produce, uh, easy to uh, complete through those methods. So we use electrochemistry, and uh, what it provides for us is the selective part uh, for particular redox state of species, which is very important for catalysis, and it is a very uh, eco-friendly and cost-effective once it is optimized. And uh, hazardous intermediates are generated and consumed at the same uh, at the very fast and contained method uh, which uh, we have a safer reaction for example uh, we have uh, Herman Colby uh, oxidation uh, uh, oxidative decarboxylation that was one of the main methods of generating uh, CO2 and also uh, we have uh, cephalosporin which is a uh, an intermediate for uh, well the th uh, the third generation of cephalosporin. Uh, one of its intermediates uh, was uh, produced through electrochemistry. And why is it important? Uh, because cephalosporin was one of uh, very well known uh, drugs for uh, AIDS. Uh, and if you look at the timeline, uh, it also shows that. Uh, the whole industrial uh, stigma towards uh, electrochemical synthesis goes back to its scalability because it doesn't generate enough profit. Uh, in, For example, in 1970s, we only had 22 products in the whole world that was uh, produced through electrochemical synthesis. Uh, we came a long way to 2014 that it reached 300 and with a lot of different uh, technological advances, especially in equipment uh, and uh, catalyst uh, manufacturing. And uh, now we have over 1,500 products uh, that are critical for pharma and also for fine chemical industries that are generated through electrochemical synthesis. Mm. And uh, one of the methods that is mm, actually uh, quite old uh, as an industrial process is Walker type oxidation, uh, uh, which th uh, through this method, uh, basically uh, we have an olefin, uh, we have an alkene, uh, which is oxidized to an al aldehyde or a ketone. Uh, as you can see in this reaction, we have a, a generation of a ketone product. And it utilizes palladium-2 catalyst. And uh, as you can see, uh, this and also a uh, copper catalyst as a uh, co catalyst for the system, and you need bubbling oxygen to generate the uh, regenerate your palladium, as uh, shown in this cycle. Uh, it's been around since 1960s. It's one of the main methods that uh, produ uh, that acetone is produced uh, through it, and uh, but the electrochemical methods is not still. Uh, uh, developed enough to, uh, for it to um, be more viable in industry, uh, despite its uh, eco-friendliness and also uh, lower uh, hazardous material, material generation. And uh, with, the, with the, just the cursory research, uh, everybody would figure out that over 95% of these processes produce, uh, use homogeneous palladium catalysts. As, as it is shown here, homogeneous catalyst is just a palladium, uh, it's just a metal salt that is uh, dispersed in the system. And, what it, um, and why is it uh, a bad thing? Uh, first of all, it uses 10 mole percent, which is a lot of catalysts and a lot of very precious metal that is also uh, 
heavily uh, heavily regulated uh, in the end product, especially for pharma by FDA and other, other regulatory uh, agencies. So using a solid supported catalyst in the same process can both improve the uh, efficacy of the system. As you can see, uh, it is uh, much more efficient uh, by using uh, about 20 times less material uh, catalyst. Uh, also, it, pr uh, it produces more material, uh, more efficient, and also uh, you don't have the contamination of uh, your product by uh, the, the metal catalyst. And uh, this is the driving force of this uh, process, uh, this research. So the rational catalyst design uh, requires an, uh, a train of thought that leads to producing a good catalyst for a specific process. And as you can see, the the this, uh, the thought behind our uh, catalyst design for this uh, process is the uh, catalytic cycle of our uh, reaction, which uh, according to it, we require palladium-2 as the uh, readily available catalytic uh, species. So what we need, we need uh, all of the system to have palladium-2. But what happens in preparing solid support catalysts is that palladium uh, or metal ions in general are reduced so that they are immobilized on the surface of the uh, support, solid support, such as graphene. So because of that, we need to optimize uh, the, our catalyst that the catalytic uh, species are preserved while the system, uh, the, the catalyst system is also immobilized on the support. So for that, we devised two methods, which is uh, which includes uh, chemical reduction and uh, incipient witness impregnation. Uh, the support that we chose was uh, graphene nanoplatelets, uh, which is uh, which are which is very cheap. Uh, it is about one gram, uh, one dollar a gram. So compared to uh, one hundred and thirteen dollar a gram of palladium chloride, if we could use uh, about twenty times less. That's uh, that would be perfect. So what we did, we basically uh, throw graphene and our palladium salt in the uh, aqueous media, uh, and at room temperature, just use uh, vitamin C, uh, a mild reducing agent, uh, for reducing the palladium particles on top of our system. And uh, with that, we prepared the, and then uh, washing, which. Uh, get to, gets rid of Im, um, non uh, immobilized uh, particles and we have our own uh, have our catalyst at the ready incipient wetness method basically thinks of, uh, it is based off of uh, basically figuring out how much uh, what is the minimum so the solvent uh, that you, ne you need to cover all the surfaces of certain amount of support. Let's say you have one gram of uh, graphene here, and uh, you just want to know what is the minimum amount of uh, solvent to completely cover all the surfaces that you have. And by measuring that, you can figure out uh, what is the minimum amount of uh, Sol uh, palladium solution that you can use and uh, without uh, dispersing the, the whole support system in the uh, solution, you just wet them, incipiently wet them. So, and it has uh, been shown that it is a very promising method and uh, it is actually uh, adopted in industry for large scale manufacturing of catalysts, especially in uh, petroleum industry. It is very uh, prominent. And uh, after that, we dry them and uh, just vacuum them uh, uh, in, uh, overnight. And we end up with uh, palladium and graphene catalysts as well. At, this, at the end, what we wanted to look at is microwave treatment. So what microwave treatment does is basically, as you know, microwave heats up everything. So the way it does it, uh, basically uh, the different atoms have different uh, absorption of energy, uh, microwave energy values. 
some absorb more, some absorb less, and it depends on their uh, m their mass, their their molecular mass, uh, and also the polarity of their structure. For example, water absorbs a lot of energy. That's why it mm, microwave heats it quite well. So in our system as well, what we have here is that uh, it's been proven in our uh, group's research and also uh, many different uh, gr research groups have, have also shown that micro treatment uh, basically heats up the, locally heats up the uh, metal particles up to uh, four to 600 degrees while uh, the support is not heated. So what it does, it basically burns the particle into the um, into the body of the uh, support. For example, here is graphene. Uh, this provides a physical defect that embed that the particle is completely embedded within it, and a very strong connection between support and the uh, uh, the catalyst particle is made. So we use that uh, as well to look into its effect uh, on each of these catalysts that we're going to use. And uh, the uh, initial characterization using X-ray uh, diffraction analysis, which looks at the crystal structure of our uh, catalyst and also X-ray photoelectron uh, spectroscopy, or XPS, that uses uh, basically uh, just looks at the different species that we have uh, we looked at the uh, amount of metal that we have and compared it with a commercially available catalyst called palladium and carbon, which shows that incipient wetness impregnation uh, produces a catalyst with relatively a smaller particle size, which is desired. And both of the, uh, the methods generate catalysts with very uh, high, high uh, percentage of palladium-2, which is also desired for us. So it is kind of expected for them to work better uh, in our in reaction compared to the commercial uh, catalyst, despite it, uh, it having lower uh, palladium loading. So then we, we go to uh, testing the reaction. And then what is de desired for us is uh, the beta oxidation, beta position oxidation, which is uh, the ketone product. Uh, and the substrate that we use here is one octene as a uh, electron deficient, heavily electron deficient uh, olefin, which is really hard to oxidize. We wanted to make sure that uh, we make the process as hard as possible so that we could see the uh, our, our catalyst activity uh, or show it as as uh, as, as uh, more uh, obvious as possible. So basically, we looked at the batch process first to, uh, to make sure that the reaction works. And as you can see, the benchmark of uh, homogeneous catalysts and commercial catalysts, they are uh, very similar to our, uh, our catalyst is very similar to them and uh, in terms of conversion of the starting material. But what makes our catalyst much better is selectivity. And selectivity means that uh, uh, most of the, for for example, for our uh, catalyst, most of the, all of the product is the beta oxidized catalyst, uh, pro, uh, product rather than alpha. Uh, whereas in like uh, commercial catalyst, we have 80% alpha position and 20% beta, which uh, leads to a less desirable product for our purpose. And uh, as you can see, we are in the ballpark and we are even better in terms of selectivity. So let's move on to the harder process and look at uh, oxidation. So uh, oxidation in exochemical setting. So what we did, we looked at the oxidation, both as you can see, the anode, uh, sorry, anode, anode cathode, and our reference electrodes. This is an undivided cell where all the all the uh, electrodes are in the same pot. Whereas in divided cell, there is a, a fret or a, excuse me. Let me go back. Yeah, uh, 
there's a thread that separates uh, anode and uh, analyte and cat, uh, catalyte uh, electrode solutions. Uh, this this way, uh, we have a more selective process. And as you can see, when we used uh, our catalyst, the conversion and selectivity, uh, the difference in conversion and selectivity compared to our uh, homogeneous and also our uh, commercial catalyst is much higher. We didn't even have a reaction happening using them, which is very, uh, very uh, in undivided cell. Uh, which is uh, kind of expected because the uh, amount of palladium two we didn't have in we have in uh, commercial catalysts is not high, and also um, it is very hard uh, when you lose uh, almost half of the catalyst you need. Uh, so uh, as homogeneous catalysts. So what it shows is that in undivided cell we get about uh, fifty to sixty five percent conversion, whereas in divided cell, it is significantly improved. And uh, basically, uh, what we had was that the oxidant that we used, which is Tempo here, to generate uh, regenerate our palladium system uh, was 20 times less uh, compared to the literature, which was 28 uh, uh, or so mole percent. And we have higher conversion, uh, higher selectivity, and the relatively similar conversion in uh, electrochemicals uh, framework. What is very interesting is that uh, you get specifically alpha position oxidation using undivided cell, whereas in divided cell, you get specifically uh, beta position oxidation. And uh, it can be uh, our hypothesis is that uh, most of the electron uh that is generated uh that is exerted to the system is being uh consumed right away by the cathode or our counter electrode which then doesn't allow the palladium to go through its cycle and the reduced palladium uh gets accumulated and we end up having uh oxidation uh, chemically favored towards alpha position and uh, again what is important is that 10 times less catalyst was used, and still we have a comparable conversion and selectivity compared to our benchmarks. The last pieces uh, that, uh, of characterization that I wanted to show is uh, looking at the uh, cyclic voltammetry of our catalyst, uh, both before on top and after uh, on the bottom. And as you can see, the uh, the catalyst, uh, the chemical catalyst, chemically reduced catalyst, loses its uh, overall uh, uh, oxidation peak uh, uh, after reaction, which shows that the mm, catalyst was uh, deactivated and also leached off of the uh, the support surface, mm, which is uh, is not seen in the uh, incipient wetness impregnation catalyst. And uh, shows that it is a uh, the uh, incipient wetness catalyst is a more uh, reliable catalyst, and uh, it can be recycled and reused uh, after um, the reaction is complete. Uh, we also looked at uh, our galvanostatic reaction monitoring and uh, tried to uh, look at the effect of uh, potential that we are using. Uh, and uh, the, basically the, the relation between the uh, the curves that we get, the potential curves that we get over time or reaction time compared to our uh, products and byproduct that is uh, generated. And uh, it is actually shown that uh, there is a, a, I think, second degree uh, direct uh, in, uh, inverse relation between the uh, conversion and uh, excuse me consumption of our uh, starting material which is the black uh, line uh, and the and our uh, galvanostatic uh, curves uh, this is uh, this is very interesting and uh, this is an avenue that is being looked at uh, to be used as a 
online method to uh, real time, uh, basically uh, characterize and uh, monitor reactions later on. The linear sweep voltammetry uh, was also uh, conducted to look at the uh, reaction of potential. And as you can see, the uh, chemical, uh, chemically, uh, chemical, chemically reduced catalyst, excuse me, uh, as you can see, it has a, er it has a very uh, earlier inflection point that shows that we have a in reaction initiated faster, but incipient wetness catalyst has a more reliable uh, over potential uh, curve, which uh, shows a more consistency and steady uh, uh, secondary slope that is um, required for a, a consistent uh, conducting uh, of reaction. And to conclude my talk, uh, I wanted to mention that palladium and graphene and nanoparticle catalysts were rationally designed for Walker top oxidation. The most effective catalysts were structurally and chemically identified. 10 times reduction in catalysts, small percent with sustainable activity was achieved by electrochemistry. 20 times reduction in oxidant, small percent uh, was uh, compensated by higher activity catalysts in electrochemical framework. And uh, at the end, reduced selectivity of Walker type oxidation of terminal olefins was successfully achieved via electrochemical cell type manipulation. With that, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank everybody for joining me for this talk, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, so at this time, we'll take any questions. Um, okay. From chat. Wow, let's see if we got any why we're okay. talking. All right. I've got a couple of questions I ask. Sure. Um, so first of all, we it, it's clear that palladium has been used for a long time. Um, yeah. So it, is there any is, does anybody know why palladium works so well? And are there any alternative catalysts? Or if there aren't, why why do they not work, and why does palladium work well? Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, choosing palladium, uh, I think it goes back to uh, the volcanic curves, as you know. And for uh, it, its redox potential is uh, the, the excuse me uh, the redox uh, activation energy and. Uh, the mechanism is very uh, favored in the, in these systems, especially for uh, for cross coupling reactions or Suzuki type reactions, which Walker is also kind of <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Walker oxidation is also another Suzuki type uh, coupling reaction uh, in in principle. So I think that's that's one of the uh, main things about it and. Uh, the other, uh, so there are other uh, catalysts that might work better. Uh, for example, if I'm not drawing, uh, I think it was, uh, it was a bunch of uh, organic metallics and like uh, uh, by metallic systems that work better, but the the cost is not justified at all in these in those systems. So that's also another thing that is uh, that needs to be. Uh, Okay, so so there are, there are other possibilities, but palladium kind of hits that sweet spot in terms of both cost exactly. and effectiveness. Correct. Okay. Um, so the other thing I was wondering was on you had a taffel plot towards the end. Um, yeah. And you so what do you what do you take as the the equilibrium potential there? Do you use the palladium oxidation, or is there a known uh, another, I'm looking value at, for alkene. Yeah, so I'm looking at the palladium, which is 0. 0.68. Okay. Yeah, I'm using that. Okay. Um, okay, so obviously we the project we've been working on is towards uh, sort of a continuous process. Uh, but one of the other things I've been wondering is, have you looked at long-term stability of the catalyst? So 
uh, in, in the electrochemical version of the reaction. I know the, the batch reaction, for instance, mm -hmm. you guys have done for several hours, um, but I was wondering if you've seen, or if you've carried out similar experiments electrochemically. Uh, so these reactions are done in six hours. Uh, all these reactions are uh, six hour reactions. Uh, but in terms of uh, catalyst, um, catalyst uh, quality, uh, it depends on the method that is uh, produced from, as you know. Uh, incipient wetness catalyst is easily recyclable and uh, it is very easy to reuse it. Okay. And it doesn't lose the quality that much. They, they all have some um, amount of leaching, uh, palladium leaching from it, but uh, I, I, I would say um, incipient witness catalyst is, uh, is a more reliable catalyst, as you know. It has a better bonding, uh, binding and a better metal anchoring in the, on the graphene surface. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, what else I had to ask you? And with the electrochemical process, you don't you don't have to use an oxidant to regenerate it, correct? Well, uh, do you have Deber, to? We used a tempo here okay. to regenerate it. If I go back to the uh, process here, if if we look at basically, uh, tempo replaces uh, copper chloride in the system. Okay. And it goes from free radical to a uh, oxidized state and go, uh, goes back and forth uh, to a uh, ketone state uh, and goes back and forth. That's why uh, I also mentioned in our own work um, that we can replace that with quinolins or different ketones uh, because it basically does the same thing, which then regenerates palladium zero that is already basically done the reaction to be regenerated into palladium two and then enters the another reaction uh, catalytic cycle. Okay, nice. So I wonder, I guess uh, maybe sometime in the future, once we're able to complete the work, we could present uh, some of the continuous flow stuff that we've been working on. Absolutely. That'd be an interesting yeah. uh, comparison with this, with this method. It's the same, mm -hmm. the same reaction, the same catalyst. The, the different requirements is kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would really love to uh, present more data, but uh, almost seventy percent more of my work in this project is already uh, under revision. Uh, so I'm not oh, allowed nice. to. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just got the comments back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, because of that, I cannot. Uh, present more, but yeah, we can talk. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Well, this is very interesting stuff. So, do you think are are there any plans to expand this to other reactions? This, yes, this, actually, uh, with 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 this knowledge base that you're kind of building up right now. Yes, absolutely, because we this is just a proof of concept, and uh, what we can get, excuse me, what we can get from a uh, just an oxidation reaction, but. Mm, the world is the possibility. So, yes, uh, with the with mm, within the scope of the center and uh, also Captain Research Lab, yes, uh, we can uh, we can expand. We we are planning to expand the uh, scope of the reactions. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'll give one last chance for anybody else. So, question. Mm -hmm. 